Good evening, folks. Um, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for having me, particularly to Inmobi. Um, really glad to see you know, so much interested uh, in Bangalore. Um, very exciting. All right, so um, I changed the topic a little bit. Um, um, I added, uh, you know, a liberal marketing, so please uh, forgive that. Um, I'm from uh, Hortworks. How many of you have heard of Hortworks? All right, that's, pretty, that's more than I expected. Good. Um, all right, so brief introduction. I'm a founder and architect at Hortonworks. Um, I, I, I lead the map views development. Formerly, formerly I was the um, uh, architect and the lead for map views dev at Yahoo. Um, my you know, primary responsibility was to run uh, map views as a service for all of Yahoo. Um, you know, code configuration, ops, um, you know, dev, DevOps, you name it. Um, in the ASF, you know, uh, we we typically call it wearing multiple hats. My uh, ASF hat is uh, I'm the VP of Apache Hadoop, which is the chair of the Project Management Committee for Apache Hadoop. I've been uh, doing full time uh, Hadoop for uh, gosh, a little over six years now, uh, pretty much since the project started. Um, yeah, long term governor PMC member and. Uh, uh, usefully in this context, I'm also the um, what's the release manager for Hadoop 2.0, right? All right. So you know, before I you know jump into uh, uh, either hot words or Hadoop, I just want to help set the context a little bit, right? So like everybody you know has heard the term big data, right? Um, be careful because big data is actually a trademark of some of the company, so. You'll want. All right. So, why is big data so important, right? So, if you look at any McKinsey, Gartner, IEC, Forrester report, what basically people are saying is that you know the amount of data that is getting generated um, is kind of overwhelming, overwhelming you know all existing systems, um, all, and this is not you know a web to auto kind of phenomenon, right? It's not Yahoo, Google. Facebook in movie kind of problem, right? It's everywhere. I mean, if you look at you know banks and you know securities and investments, you look at retail. Um, these guys are all like drowning in data, right? So what do they do with this data at this point? Any idea? What do they do with this? They just drop it. They throw it away. They're like, it's such a big problem. I can't deal with it. I'm just going to forget about it, right? So that is essentially what is happening. Uh, Across the spectrum, right? I mean, you look at all of the enterprise. This is exactly what's happening. So, the answer, and and actually, this is from May 2011, which was you know 12 months ago. If you look at this, the amount of data is actually growing at you know 800, 900 percent per year, and uh, most of it is actually unstructured. 90 percent of it is unstructured. That's another problem, right? All the existing systems were you know primarily meant, uh, primarily you know designed to deal with structured data. So, how do we get here, right? Um, you know, clearly, you know, all the web product companies were, um, you know, the pioneers here. And even among them, right, the, the biggest use case was actually, you know, you know, web search, right? Most of the Yahoo Hadoop team actually came from web search. Um, and that's a, you know, interesting, uh, interesting tidbit because that gives you an idea of where the problems were. Right, and when you think about web search, it's as big as any you can think of. Right, I mean, like I keep I keep saying that web search is the you know quintessential big data problem. Right, and if you think about it for one second, right, if you want to web search, what do you have to right, you actually have to download the web. Right, this is not BitTorrent, this is not you know peer to peer or Kaza or whatever. You've got to have a copy of every single web page in the world. Think about that for a second, right? Every single web page in the world, you won't have a copy. But wait, one copy is not enough, right? Because you want multiple copies. You want multiple copies because you want to see how the web is changing over a period of three months or six months. So even when we started, you know, six, seven years ago doing Hadoop, our goal was to keep about 10 copies of the entire web, right? That's just storage. Now you think about processing, right? That's fine. It's great to have you know a copy of the web, but how do you actually implement search on top of it, right? 
to implement search on top of it, you know, you guys have, you know, how many of you have heard of PageRank? Right, lots of people. Now, how does PageRank work? Right, PageRank works by trying to analyze the links and to, it tries to, um, it tries to figure out the importance of the link. So to do that analyzing the importance of a link, what you have to do is, uh, the first thing you need to do is actually build a graph, right? And in that graph of the World Wide Web, what you're doing is every web page, every URL becomes a node of the graph, right? And every hyperlink becomes an edge. So if you go to yahoo.com, yahoo.com probably has, you know, at any point it probably has like 300, 400, 500 links. So you have to keep all of those links. You have to build a graph with that. And if you look at the incoming links to yahoo.com, they're probably like billions actually. Think of the number of uh, web pages in the world which either have a link which is yahoo.com or google.com. Right? That is the graph you're trying to build. So even in 2006 when we started doing Hadoop, right? What we were trying to do with Hadoop was to replace existing systems which did this with Hadoop. And even in 2006, we had a um, hundred billion URLs in our in our database. I don't mean like MySQL. I mean like in case of a database, right? So we had hundred billion URLs, and we had over one tri no, ten trillion edges actually in that graph. So you have a graph which has hundred billion nodes and ten trillion edges, right? So that is you know the pretty much the definition of big data, right? So that's the context and that's where we started off and we went out, right? We kind of went out and you said, all right, next what we do, we do op advertising optimization, we do mail anti spam, we do, you know, user interest, interest prediction, data mining, anything you can think of kind of went from there. But all of them still at this point are, you know, they still um, are not at the same scale as web search. So the fact that, you know, companies like Yahoo and Google had to build a system like Google, right, of course Google's got that proprietary stuff, gives you an indication of where the pain points were, right, essentially they're web search companies, right, and that's the kind of context for big data, right. Alright, so that was how we go there. But how do we, you know, to make it even more real from a web, non-web search perspective, what would we trying to do? Um, at Yahoo with Hadoop, right? A simple use case is, you know, personalization of Yahoo.com, right? So if you go to Yahoo.com, it's not a static page today. You know, five years ago it was. Everybody in the world, given the same uh, set of geographical, so if you were in California, if you were in Bangalore, right? You, everybody in Bangalore would see the same Yahoo.com web page, period. The only customization was depend was dependent on the geography. If you were in California, you saw some. If you were in London, you saw something else. If you were in Bangalore, you saw something else. But today, it's completely different. Yahoo has, I believe, something like 800 million registered users, or probably a billion registered users. Right? For every single one of them, it's personalized. So you, as the user, are not doing any work. Right? You're still going to Yahoo.com, but it's getting personalized for you. And how do you do this? It's actually with Hadoop, right? So if you think about it, it's actually a pretty cool technology under the hood. Next, Yahoo Mail, right? So Yahoo Mail delivers, and this was like slightly older, <coughs> it probably delivers close to 10 billion emails a day. And 90% of it is spam, right? If anti-spam didn't work, email would be completely unusable, right? So again, Hadoop is the answer, right? Hadoop does all of the back-end processing to actually prevent anti-spam for you as the user, right? And that's again, you know, a good use case for Hadoop. All right, so all of this are web Colorado, and where are we today, right? Hadoop is pretty much everywhere you can think of, right? From the New York Times to um, Microsoft, the University of Nebraska, or Maryland, it's pretty much used by everybody else. I mean, I was seeing this thing where, um, eHarmony claims that, you know, 20% of U.S. marriages are because of Hadoop. <laughs> Pretty cool. Right. Um, one of my uh, really interesting use cases were, um, they use Hadoop to predict earthquakes. Right? That's a really nice use case. It's really, you know, satisfying. Okay. So, as we go forward, right, this is where you kind of see big data and how it's getting used across industries. Right? Um, healthcare. 
Um, I can't name them, but I talked to at least two different, you know, two different startups in the last uh, you know, couple of months mm. who are actually trying to do personalized medicine. Right? What they're trying to do is actually take your data, all kinds of data, your DNA, your you know, blood sugar, your heartbeat, whatever it is, right? And they're trying to personalize medicine for you. They're building molecules and they're trying to personalize medicines for you as they do it. Right? That's a big data problem. You know, for a single user, it's not a big deal, right? A single user is probably 10 to at most 10 gigabytes of data. But they want to scale. They want to do it for everybody in the world. And that, if, that, if you multiply, you know, 10 gigabytes by 6 billion people, that's a lot of data. Right? That's a big data problem. Um, retail, right? Everybody's trying to figure out what is the best placement for product, for this product. One of my, um, you know, favorite examples is apparently uh, Walmart places uh, on Friday afternoons, they place diapers and beer in the same aisle. Think about it, it's diapers and beer. Because they expect single fathers to go buy diapers on Friday evenings, right? That is the kind of impact doing analytics has on your business, right? And that's what all these guys are trying to do, right? Um, you know, financial services, you know, Visa is trying to figure out whether a credit card transaction is fraudulent or not. A simple example is if you if you do a credit card transaction, you know, greater than, um, I, I believe it's like a few, a few hundred, uh, few hundred miles or a few thousand miles or whatever. If you, if you buy something in Bangalore and in the next second you buy something from Delhi, there's a very high chance that it's a fraudulent transaction. Right? That's a big data problem. Right? You multiply, I mean, Visa probably has, um, Forget what the number is. Some like 60, 70, 80 percent of the online of all transactions in the world go through Visa. So if you think about all 70 percent of uh, all credit card transactions in the world go through Visa, right? So that's a big data problem. So the context in front of is that big data is everywhere. You just don't recognize it. Right? Okay. Um, I'll just run through this. You guys probably already know this. So I'm going to skip this. You know, what is Apache Hadoop? You know. Just, uh, just thing I want to make sure is when I say Hadoop, I don't mean in, in the rest of the presentation, I just don't mean core Hadoop, which is HDFS and MapReduce, but I, I mean the whole Hadoop ecosystem, right? Um, you know, this is the, you know, one of my, you know, favorite slides where we talk about what is known as the Apache way. The big thing in, and Apache, I mean, of course, you know, Hadoop is a, you know, lots of Hadoop success comes from the fact that it's part of the Apache software foundation, right? Um, and the big thing in uh, Apache is that uh, it's called a community over code. What it means is, you know, if somebody gets hit by a bus with a mean or a shuttle, or somebody gets hit by a bus, nothing happens to it, right? That's why community is important. Um, it's got a really big open source community, and of course, part of uh, as part of works in Yahoo, uh, we're really proud to be the by far the majority contributors. So, um, just a little bit about works. Um, you guys probably know this, but you know, uh, early last year, um, yeah, outside mid last year, Yahoo decided to spin off the um, Hadoop team. I mean, of course, Yahoo embraced Spartan work, um, Hadoop six years ago at this point to crunch, uh, you know, epic amounts of data. I mean, this was basically web search problem. Um, slightly old, slightly dated, but at this point, uh, Yahoo is close to 50,000 votes. Um, it's, it's close to like 10 million jobs per month on Hadoop, and uh, it does more than 10 petabytes of IO per day per cluster uh, at any given point. So that's what it is. So Yahoo then, in early, um, you know, mid to early to mid 2011, it started to spin off uh, most of its Hadoop team into Hortonworks. You guys are sure that's a good uh, uh, article from Wired. All right, so what are we doing as Hortonworks? Right? Our vision is we really think that by the next four or five years, more, at least half the world's data will be touched by Hadoop, whether it's storage or processing. Um, it's a, you know, it's it's bold, but realistically um, speaking, there's almost inevitable at this point because there's simply no other option for this kind of scale of data storage and processing, right? Which is really cool. So how do we achieve that vision? Right? It's a big vision. How do we achieve it? What we want to do is enable a big ecosystem around this. And it's not just going to be, you know, Hardworks or Yahoo or whatever or Facebook. It's going to be a big ecosystem. It's going to be, you know, you guys, right? 
uh, as users or vendors or uh, you know, part of the community. That's what we're trying to get there. Okay, so what are the challenges, right? The challenges are at this point, you know, one, two, three are lack of talent, right? Literally. Um, at this point, it's lack of talent because Hadoop is a new system, right? It's absolutely new. It's not replacing, one of the really cool parts of Hadoop is it's not replacing any existing technology, right? Per se. Right? If you think about um, you know, MySQL, it replaced an exact, you know, existing RDBMS, right? Or at least attempted to replace it. If you think about Linux, it attempted to replace an existing operating system, which was Unix, right? But Hadoop is not replacing anything, right? It's, before Hadoop, there was nothing else, right, in this space. And that's why it's a problem for us. It's a problem for, you know, the ecosystem because it's actually brand new, right? What we really need is, you know, this notion of Hadoop DBS, right? You know, everybody knows what a DBA is, right? Somebody who understands a database who's actually an expert at dealing with the database. So what we need is a concept of Hadoop database or DBA, right? <coughs> I mean, I, I mean it as a throwaway, right? Hadoop is not a database, but still we need the concept of a DBA and Hadoop who's, you know, reasonably expert at using it. Um, so what is the status quo at this point, given the challenges? Um, in spite of all the challenges, almost every single Fortune 500 at this point is has a Hadoop POC, right? Which means it's a really useful technology and it's actually making a real and meaningful difference to these guys, which is why they're using it, right? In spite of all the challenges and, you know, frankly, even the maturity of the system, right? Um, so how are they using it? The wide, in terms of data, is being filled by kind of boutique consulting firms. I mean, we at Hardware's actually deal with a lot of them. Uh, we can introduce you to lots of them if you want. Um, they're niche and expensive, yet, yet they're very, very profitable. The reason they're profitable is because demand kind of far outstrips supply. Right, it goes back to the talent problem. And, you know, the big system integrators, like Pro, Infosys, TCS, Accenture, Capgemini, these guys are still missing, but at some point they'll be there, right? That's a pretty big opportunity. So, what do we do, right? So, what we want to do as Hortonworks is we want to provide technology leadership via open source. Right? Um, everything we do, every, every line of code I've written for six years now is, has been is being into open, and I really enjoy doing that. And frankly, at this point, you know, enterprises are actually much more open to using open source technology than they were even two, year, two three years ago. In fact, you know, things like the governments, right? Um, the British government and even the Indian government, for example, they are very, very keen on replacing their proprietary stuff with open source. Primarily because it takes away this concept of a lock in. Because there's no lock in, they can actually freely move beyond vendors. When they actually can move beyond vendors, it means it increases the competition and it means you, you as the customer win. Right? So that's the you know, economics of it. Um, and of course, what we want to do is you know, enable the ecosystem so that we actually, as part of Hortonworks, we want to enable the ecosystem so that what we get is you know, enterprise pool and not technology push. What I mean by that is, you know, I field calls on a regular basis by, you know, a large bank or an insurance firm saying, look, we really like Hadoop, we want to figure out, we want to use it, can you help us use it? It's not like we, we are going in and telling, you know, a big bank that this is Hadoop, this is what it does, you know, you want to use it, right? It's the other way around. They are calling us up, right, which is a good problem. And the way we want to go about as part of Hotworks is we want to do all of this, we want to have a consumable, a fully feature of completely uh, fully featured and consumable <coughs> standard Hadoop stack um, and a roadmap which is open for everybody to see, right? The reason we want to do this is not, you know, not merely charity, but it's because it makes good business sense, right? What we're trying to do is actually open up the market. If there's proprietary technology, we have competitors who do, you know, like open core, what is known as the open core model, right? Most of it is open, but if you really want to use it, you have to pay for it, right? We don't want to do that. Because if we do that, what we've seen is people still are afraid of lock-in because of that proprietary stuff around it, right? Well, even though the code is open, they might not be able to use it at all because the stuff which is really important is around it, right, and it's not free, right? So we have competitors to do that, we don't want to do that. Um, and this way we also share our, you know, roadmap and vision because it's really open, that's it. All right, <coughs> so, you know, I'll move quickly into this. Um, so as you as we see it, how does Hadoop fit in? You know, you guys are all 
you know, using the word include, actually just put it in context for somebody else, right? Today, this is what enterprise has, right? So they have essentially three types, right? Three disparate systems. They have serving applications, which is, you know, web serving or RDMS or whatever. Um, they have traditional BI and data warehouses, you know, EDW, data marts, BI analytics, and they also have unstructured data, right? These are now three different systems and they're managed differently, right? What is also important to understand is it's not just, you know, this one triangle. In a typical enterprise, there'll be 10 copies of this triangle, right? Because every business unit within that uh, enterprise will have the same stack and they don't talk to each other, right? So the data marts in, you know, the mortgage department will be separate from the data mart in the credit card department, right? And they can't talk to each other, right? That's a big problem. So what we see if you do pass is that, right? So we see it in the kind of becoming the connector to all of these systems. And it's it's connecting not just in you know, this 2D, but it's also connecting in 3D, three dimensions, right? So it's connecting across your um, business units. And that's a really big deal because you finally have one place where you can actually look at all your data. And that's, you know, good, right? Um, and again, we talked about this, right? Gartner thinks there'll be like 800% data growth year on year, and 80 to 90% is actually unstructured, right? I mean, if you think about it, all you guys have a smartphone, right? Everybody has a smartphone. Now, the amount of data that's being generated from a smartphone, whether it's the web, you know, whether it's the websites you're browsing or the email that you're reading or whatever it is, is all data, right? We call it the digital exhaust. Now, people are trying to figure out how to, you know, do better with that data. And all of that is actually unstructured. It's not rows and columns, right? That's a big deal. And in sort of um, broader context, this is what Hadoop looks like, right? There's data, there's apps, and there's operations. So Hadoop, that's the triangle, right? All right. So to address these challenges, we, we have what we call um, Hardware Data Platform, or HTTP for short. Like I talked about, this is the consumable and standard Hadoop platform and roadmap. Right? This is a, you know, a brief overview, right? It's got all the stuff you're probably familiar with. The interesting ones are um, from what we see is actually things like uh, Edge Catwalk. How many, how many of you have heard of Edge Catwalk? Yeah, not many people. So Edge Catwalk is actually one of the coolest technologies which you know, people don't know about at this point. What Edge Catwalk does is it provides table and metadata management information. <laughs> HDFS is where you store your data, right, or HBase. Um, in HDFS, it's just files and directories. So you don't know any metadata. You don't know what are the rows there, what are the columns there, how many rows are there, how many columns are there, any of that information. Edge Catalog provides you that, right? Edge Catalog not only provides you that, that metadata for what is stored on HDFS, it also provides you for metadata for what is stored on HBase, what is stored on a, a traditional RDBMS, for example, an Oracle or a MySQL. So you can now, using Edge Catalog, it also gives you storage drivers and everything. So you can now write a simple MapReduce job, or a pig job, or a Hive job, which can talk to Edge Catalog, get metadata about the data, like where is, what, you don't have to now care about what your, where your directories are and so on, right? Edge Catalog provides that information for you. You just talk to Edge Catalog and say, give me this table called foo, right? Edge Catalog will figure out if it's an Oracle or if it's an HPS or if it's an HDFS. It'll also give you the right input format if you want to actually talk to process that data, right? So it's a really big deal. Then there's um, Ambali, which is a management system. Again, that's part of Apache. Um, it's, mo it's management and monitoring and consoles and UI, GUI and dashboards and all of that for installing for installing it to do the full stack, not just HDFS or MapReduce. It's for installing the full stack, it's for monitoring it, it's you know, for alerts and all of that. It's got integration with Nagios and Ganglia, all of the standard technologies. So you can now download this one thing to actually install it. And the really cool part is all of this is open source and all of this is Apache. So if you want to modify it, you're welcome to. We hope that you not only modify it, but also contribute it back because that way all of us can win together, right? So it's a standard open source thing. So I'm going to run through the slides quickly. So what we're trying to do with HTTP is allow Apache to be aggressive. Um, but we, 
uh, the Apache releases will be aggressive, but we take the most stable Apache releases and they go, they're purely from Apache. There's no patches, nothing fancy or nothing funky happening there. And we ship it when it's stable. We use our uh, relationship with Yahoo to actually help stabilize releases. Um, we do a lot of work, QA and so on, to actually do it. But once it's ready, we actually ship it. Right? Why is it important? Because if you look at individual projects, they look like this, right? They're sharp arrows and you can cut yourself, right? So what we do is we pick the right versions and we integrate them, we test them, we make sure they all work together, and then we actually ship it as part of HTTP. Um, like I said, there's no lock-in. Uh, the, the cool part is you can actually come to a website, figure out you know what versions there are, and go to Apache and download it. There's no difference. Right? It's exactly identical bit for bit. This way, there's nothing funky. You, you know what you're getting is is free and open. Um, in terms of the distro model itself, we have three, what do you call the main arrows, um, or the bullseye. The center is Kubernetes or main HTTP, which is fully open, fully Apache, fully open source, and it's fully supported. Right? We have L1 and 2 L3 support. You know, two hours, 60, you know, two hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, SLA and so on. Right? The universe is um, the universe is the um, non-Apache sometimes open source ecosystem. I mean, think of it like Nagios or Pandia, right? They're not um, ASF, but they're still part of it. The multiverse actually includes some applications which you download um, from from you know third parties, for example. You can download from our site if you want. An example is you know we work with uh, partners like Mark Logic or Informatica. Informatica has this really cool parser uh, for parsing you know like 200. Thousand kinds of data, right? CDRs or health records or whatever. We, we bundle it, it's optionally installed, but you, we don't support it. You go get support from the third party, right? So it basically depends on what kind of support you're getting. And where are we right now? We are now in HTTP 1, which is 1.x, which is based on Hadoop 1.x. Um, Hadoop Next will be based on Hadoop 2.x. Um, I'll talk about it in more detail and then beyond. This is HTTP 1, you guys are familiar with it, it's uh, based on Hadoop 1.x. Uh, so the highlights are, it's the you know, first Apache release that supports HBase security and all that. But we were part of Yahoo, uh, you know, folks like me and Sharad and, and Srikant, uh, we all worked on security. Uh, we spent, you know, two years working on end to end uh, strong authentication with uh, Kerberos, and that's part of 1.x. It's got Edge Catalog, um, and this are like, you know, like I said, this are the different versions we ship. Um, Hadoop, HTTP2 is based on Hadoop 2.0, um, I'll talk more about it, um, let's quickly go on, okay, Hadoop 2, right, so in context, I just want to set the context of why Hadoop 2 is a big deal, right, um, as you guys know, Hadoop started initially as a part of Apache Nutch, right, and then Yahoo picked it up in early 2006. Um, when we started in 2006, Hadoop would work <coughs> about two nodes. You could not run Hadoop with more than two nodes, right? At this point, pretty much everybody else is doing it. Um, initially, we did the, you know, monthly releases, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 and stuff. Um, that was like a long time ago. And after Hadoop 0 0.15, we needed more stability um, because Hadoop started becoming more and more important at Yahoo. So we started doing port releases until um, Hadoop 20 in, uh, in actually 2009. Now Hadoop 20 is, um, fortunately or unfortunately, still the basis of all the Hadoop distributions you find today. Whether it's Apache, Hadoop 1.0, or it's CDS 3 or HTTP 1, they're all based on the same code base, right? I mean, of course, we've added, of course we've added security and so on. Um, you know, with Hadoop 20 or 2 or 3, but essentially Hadoop 1 is security for the brand plus web HTTP. Right. So that's why Hadoop 2 is like the first major release now in uh, since 2009 actually. So that's over three years since you've done a you know, absolutely major release. And what do you get there? Um, Suresh, I guess he didn't cover Federation, so I'll do it for him. So Federation, um, the big deal with Federation is it it allows us to scale HDFS even more than what can it can predict. It does it by actually separating out the namespace management from block storage, right? The namespace management is things like files and directories, right? 
where the files are, where the directories are. That is managed by um, the name node. So we split that apart from block storage, which is to figure out where is that replica. Do we have extra replicas or, or you know, too few replicas and so on. So this way it allows us to scale <coughs> HDFS much better. In, rea in reality, what it means is that from now on, with federation, in a single HDFS cluster, you'll, have, you'll actually have multiple name nodes like that. Right? This will allow us to scale much more. Even though we're having, it's important to remember that even though we have multiple name nodes, we're not splitting the data. Right? We're not partitioning your data nodes. Every data node will actually still talk to multiple name nodes. It'll actually you know, respond to multiple masters. Right? This way, there's no silo of you know, raw storage. Um, the next one is uh, you know what I've been focusing on. You know, me, Shara, lots of people here actually been focusing on is MapReduce. You know, Turado or uh, what he calls Yarn. Right. So Yarn is an attempt to take Hadoop beyond just MapReduce. Right. What it means is so far you have data on in HDFS or HBase, let's say. Right. The only option you have to process that data is actually just MapReduce. Right? The only algorithm you can run on that data is just MapReduce. Um, you know, MapReduce is great. I really love MapReduce. I've been doing it for six years now. But unfortunately, MapReduce is not the right answer for all your data processing needs. Right? And we recognize that. I mean, if you're doing iterative processing, for example, you can do it 10 times faster in you know, an alternate paradigm. Right? Um, so what we've done is we've taken MapReduce and we have generalized it to the point where it's now basically like a distributed operating system, right? The central resource manager is like the brain or the heart or the, you know, the scheduler. And you can now schedule across nodes. I mean, think of it as Unix, right? With Unix, you can schedule process. What you run in the process, Unix doesn't care, right? It's some sort of instructions, right? Same thing with, um, you know, Yarn at this point. You can write your own application, which can be anything actually. There's a standard APIs you get. You know, similar to Unix port, you get some standard APIs. So if you use the APIs, what you do using the APIs is completely up to you, right? One of the one of the applications is actually MapReduce, right? You can write different kinds of them, but we've written the MapReduce application. So you can now write, uh, you know, an MPI application or a you know uh, a graph processing application like Giraffe or you know Spark or whatever it is, right? All of them can run in the same group. So it's really a big deal. And it's something we're very excited about. And we've actually spent a lot of time on it. We've spent almost two years at this point on this. Right? So this is going to be, it's already part of, you know, Hadoop 2. So what, in terms of the map reduce, you have the framework, you can plug in your map and reduce logic. So in, in similar sense, you're saying, you, I mean, other distributed processing paradigms, exactly. you'll have pluggable code. I mean, I just give my, my logic and it runs in that paradigm? Yes. So you can basically run, I mean, if you're familiar with, are you familiar with MPI or any other paradigm? Right? Not in detail, but yeah. yeah. Level, so you can now run an MPI application within Hadoop. Right, so far you were write, only writing maps and reduces, right? You can now run an MPI application, which is very, very different from a map reduce application. So, so today actually what happens is you, in order to solve a problem, you have to think of a map reduce solution for that. Exactly. And which may or, I mean, which may work because exactly. there so, is the only solution you so have. So today, to, your only you option is you you to break down your application into the MapReduce paradigm. You have to force fit it. Yeah. We are taking that out. What we are doing is we are allowing you to use the most natural way to process that data. Right? So that's the really big part of uh, Yarn at this point. It really opens up the game when it comes to processing data on Hadoop. Um, if you guys want, maybe at the end of it, I can do a you know, five minute deep dive into this uh, to help you understand uh, but see if, if there's an opportunity. Right? Okay, so after that, it's uh, you know, the really the next big important piece in Hadoop is actually um, name node HA, and of course, you know, I'm not going to waste your time more than that. Performance, right? Everybody cares about performance. Um, with Hadoop 2, we're pretty much getting 2x performance across the board, whether it's HDFS or MapReduce, right? Um, so we have things like you know HDFS redirect performance and MapReduce got you know a bunch of improvements. One of the important ones is um, um, we have, you know, we, me and uh, Owen actually broke the Terrasort record about three years ago. Uh, since this is the first release in three years, all of that performance improvements are finally getting unlocked in a major place. So we get, you know, 30% improvement in the shovel and so on. Deployment, um, you know, this is what we want to get to. 
I'm probably the first time I'll go fast. Um, what does it take to get there? Um, you know, theory testing, benchmarks, and integration testing, and lots of it. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. Benchmarks, uh, you probably understood this. Uh, we kind of we benchmark pretty much every part of the HDFS and MapReduce pipeline. You know, HDFS is very direct throughput, end to end operations with MapReduce, it's, you know, uh, scan, shuffle, sort. We have something called GridMix. Um, are people familiar with GridMix? Probably not. So, GridMix allows us the ability to take production places and run them in a, in a test cluster, right? That's really important because now we can actually test real applications in a test environment, right? That's what GridMix gives us. And of course, we do integration testing across the um, stack. HBase, Big, Hive, Uzi, you, know, you name it. Um, deployment. Um, we kind of do, we already did alpha test, you know, last year. We're all in 500 nodes. Um, right now we're in alpha, and pretty much a majority of users at Yahoo have actually, you know, tested it at this point, which is, I'm talking about HDFS 2.0, you know, map news 2.0, the whole stack, right? Um, we go to beta and then production, hopefully, in the middle of this year. All right, so, I'm going to spend the last two minutes on this. Um, what we do is, how do we, you know, all of Kind of uh, free and open. How do we make money, right? We make money primarily with support and training, right? We prop, you know, we do all the full life cycle tech to support L1, L2, L3, um, and it's delivered by people who actually put in like 90% of the code. Yeah. Training, um, we have you know, at least three different courses, both uh, you know, in a classroom setting and on site, so we can come basically to your company and do it for you. Uh, things like and uh, analyzing big data. There's some more information if you guys want. And that's it. Any questions? Uh, you spoke about YAM. In that you said you can plug in now MPA. I remember somewhere you said about Storm or S4 yeah. or something like that. So can you expand how would that work in this? Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. So the way this would work is Right. So the way this works is in the new system, what happens is when you submit a job, right, the first task that you get becomes the master for that job. So every job will have its own master. So for the MapReduce job, you get a MapReduce master, right? That master is now responsible for talking to the resource manager and getting more containers. They call them containers. They're equivalent to tasks, right? right? Getting more containers. So once you get the containers, you run them on whatever node you got them on, right? So this guy's containers are here and here, for example, right? So what this means is, the way you would implement MPI or Storm or S4 is you have to implement uh, an application master for Storm or S4 or MPI, right? And then you can get containers from the resource manager and run Storm tasks or MPI tasks or, you know, S4 tasks, right? So that's the way we can actually scale and do any, pretty much anything you want in the system. Right. So one thing you can actually do is actually, you know, launch virtual machines if you want, right? Talk to the resource manager and launch virtual machines. You know, that's like any cloud platform or whatever. Right, does that answer your question? So for these processing and these big other paradigms, do they align with HDFS data storage model in terms of replica, allowing, allowing data partitioning and running them as I, I mean, for the, Run it where the to. data is. They don't have to. I mean, if they, they can choose to because you can, there's, of course, HDFS. So you can do exactly what MapReduce <laughs> Application Master will do. He will figure out where the data replicas are and try to schedule them on those racks and those nodes. And the resource manager will, will also help. So you can have, if you, the resource manager, if you ask him for container on node A, he'll try to give you that container on node A. If it's not available, he'll try to give you on, on, a, different, on, the, on a different node in the same rack. So the resource manager will actually help you a lot then. Right? So, you as the person writing the application master you can choose to take advantage of that. Right? In things like MPI, you probably don't care. Storm, you probably don't care. Right? But other, you know, other things, if you're writing like, like something like Giraffe, for example, if you're doing graph crossing, you probably care. So, it depends on the paradigm and it's up to you. So, what we think is over time, we'll probably have like four or five or six standard application masters which we will support. 
anything, and those will be you know written by people who understand it and be you know, optimized for that paradigm. But if you're trying to do something on your own, you can of course choose to figure out what you. I mean, this gives you the APIs, right? How you choose to use the APIs is essentially up to you as the application. Right? But what we'll expect is there'll be like four or five or ten standard ones, and they'll be implemented by people who really understand the system. So it's probably optimized for that use case. Like MapReduce, we spend a lot of time on it. Um, and the MapReduce application master, you know, does all of that work and more, right? Uh, but it depends on the use case, essentially. Essentially, this is an operating system, right? You're writing an application. How you write that application is actually up to you. Any other questions? Uh, since you are launching this HDP, the, the full platform, so, so should we expect distros like YAM or... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Actually. So you have normally distros like YAM, you have RPMs and devs and you know, like seven different platforms to support. So so say, fully compatible with each other. Like, yeah, absolutely. Hmm? You can go download it. When you are making part of Linux, it's a, some distribution itself. Like, um, it unfortunately, I can't talk about it. <laughs> So, to so, this is similar to, you know, I mean, this is actually like similar to Torque or, you know, Moab or something, except that it does a lot more than any of them, right? Uh, we've come from a different angle where none of the existing ones, like Slurm or Torque or Moab or Moab, they understand data locality, right? The big difference here is that the resource manager actually understands data locality. And that's really, really critical for MapReduce, and it's also critical for a lot of big data applications. Whether you're doing MapReduce or you're doing graph processing, massive graph processing, that data locality matters a lot, right? So this guy is similar to Doc or Moya or Moab, but you know, more advanced in that, he actually cares more locality. So that's the big difference. Built into the it's built into the resource manager. It's not, you don't have to do it in the application master, the resource manager can do it. But your applications would really decide the locality and how the data management moment needs to happen. Correct. Yeah. So, so you, you can say that I want a container on this node, right? The resource manager will say, but look, I can't give you this container on this node, but I understand that I, can, I have another node on the same rack, which is very close, so you probably get very good locality anyway. And all of that smarts built into the resource manager. Yeah. That's something that you know, not nobody else, no other resource manager actually has. So now, like resource manager is like a single point of failure. In the yeah. So the question is, what about availability? So the single, I mean, we're working uh, at this point. We're working to actually, I mean, we have like code. It's not yet well tested. So what we're doing is all the resource manager state is backed up on Zookeeper. So if something happens with resource manager, we can quickly reboot on a, on a different resource manager. And you can come back online in a matter of seconds. Actually, it's not like HDFS where you have to store a lot more data. There's a lot more state to store in HDFS in the name of. Here, it's actually very little state. It's literally like uh, 256 bytes per container or something, and there'll probably be you know, a few, maybe a hundred thousand containers. So it's very very small amount of data. So it's easy to backup. So in that case, how would uh, uh, a backup resource manager be brought into the picture using a VIP? How would be the it's okay. So, so Zuki would store it, but how do the clients actually do yeah, it? Yeah, it'll be a, a virtual IP or whatever. It depends on the install actually. Yeah, IP failover is the standard. Code. Most enterprises like IP failover. Um, you mentioned about Ambari, but it's been, I think, inactive for a long time. What is the roadmap for Ambari? Uh, I wouldn't say it's been inactive, but you should see definitely, you should definitely see a release in the next, uh, I would say in the next 30 years. So you should definitely be able to download and play with it. It'll do all of the install and dashboards and monitoring as well. So you mentioned that unstructured data is the majority, so what is the strategy to, I mean, so, I mean, are you kind of... HDFS, right, HDFS can store any kinds of data. No, no, I mean, as in, in the sense that, I mean, understanding any form of unstructured data, which could be very, very vertical specific, I mean, uh -huh. how do you see, I mean, without that, uh, not a lot of processing can be expressed. So that's why, you know, edge catalog is important. With edge catalog, you can actually take an unstructured data and still describe to it, right? Edge catalog doesn't have to work with only an RDBMS, right? It works with stuff on HDFS or edge base. 
So that's why H catalog is very important. So H catalog will capture the metadata, but what I meant, I mean, say when you talk about H part, uh, like, uh, I mean, so, I, I mean, so, suppose you want to sell into financial domain which deals with credit cards, you have a specific message format. Unless you have kind of interpreters for those, you like, you, yeah. you, you you really can't process the data itself. So, so what happens is people today are already have already written it. Um, in a lot of cases, they choose to go with something commercial like H parts. So lots of them available. Uh, but they're probably not as good as that possible because you know Informatica has probably worked on it for a long time, right? Uh, it's, it depends on the quality, but they're definitely optional. Sorry, guys, can we stop now? Arun will be available uh, yeah, for can. some time after this, so people can catch him. I'll try to run the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.